thank you very much uh, for uh, having me here. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation from Renzo, as many of us. It's a beautiful place and it's uh, a wonderful conference. So uh, I will be talking about my joint work with Hisham Satya, which we posted on the archive in 2021, last year. And um, yeah, so um, let me move on with that. So uh, here is the story. So, so once upon a time at Harvard in 2001, Iqbal, Naitsky and Wafa discovered a mysterious duality. Uh, so the mysterious duality by, uh, according to them, was uh, that they noticed uh, similar symmetry patterns, namely the EK uh, exceptional series patterns happening on the math side uh, in algebraic geometry of del Pezzo surfaces, uh, which are called BK. Uh, and uh, this is a series of surfaces, and it had been known for years, if not centuries, uh, that um, they uh, give rise to this exceptional root systems series, uh, like E1, E2, E3, and so on, E6, E7, E8. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, uh, it was this... Uh, so what, what uh, Iqbal, Naitsky and Wafa did uh, is that they uh, related this known fact about uh, the algebraic geometry of del Pezzo surfaces as given rise to this exceptional series EK of root systems. They related to uh, to what happens in M theory and eleven dimensional supergravity and uh, di uh, dimensional reductions uh, of those theories. So they said, uh, let's start with the eleven dimensional supergravity M theory and look at uh, the typical brains that happen uh, happen that uh, occur there and. Um, then uh, look at uh, certain quantities associated to those brains, such as um, the energy and the tension of those brains. And um, then they found similar things that happen in algebraic geometry. And they said they had no clue why that was happening, like uh, what, what the reason was for uh, the same story happening in physics uh, in those uh, toroidal compactifications or dimensional reductions of uh, M theory from 11 dimensions to lower dimensions. They uh, just noticed some numerical coincidences. But the reason why this was uh, uh, this pattern in physics was related to this pattern in algebraic geometry was a total mystery. Uh, and here I, I mentioned that. The, uh, the algebraic geometric pat pattern uh, is very classical. It's, uh, for instance, uh, it basically this uh, exceptional series EK of root systems, which arises for, this, uh, for the del Pezzo surfaces in algebraic geometry, is explained very nicely. Uh, the reason why there are exactly 27 li lines on the cubic surface, and this is the result of Cayley and Salman of 1849. Uh, and uh, well, 27, if you ever studied exceptional uh, series of Lie algebras uh, and the exceptional series of Lie algebras and their representations, uh, the 27 is the dimension of the fundamental representation of the Lie algebra E6 of type E6, the first sort of exceptional Lie algebra. Uh, and uh, it's it kind of a, a very beautiful and nice relation between uh, in classical algebraic geometry and root systems. Uh, and uh, what Iqbal, Naisky and Waffe noticed is that there is this uh, re uh, similar, there is a similar relation coming out uh, between uh, those physical theories, M theory and this dimensional reductions, uh, and the exceptional series of EK root systems. And the mystery was uh, that uh, why does it happen? And uh, give like an explanation, maybe a constructive or conceptual explanation of, of this. And this is what we addressed uh, in, with Hisham Satya, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so, uh, but first of all, let me basically, let me basically describe uh, some bits of those stories. Uh, in order to understand what happens, one needs to dig a little bit into uh, what happens in algebraic geometry, 
and uh, what uh, happens in uh, M theory and its dimensional reductions. So uh, in algebraic geometry, as I said, uh, uh, Delpezzo surfaces is a series of surfaces, complex, complex, smooth surfaces. Um, so there are four dimensional real uh, manifolds of varieties, um, but uh, as complex manifolds, they're two dimensional. And uh, this is why called surfaces. And they can be classified topologically by belonging to one of the following types, B0, B0 which is CP2, B1, B2, and so on, B8. Uh, and there is one outlier, this, uh, this uh, surface, which is also a del Pesto surface, CP1 cross CP1. So they are characterized by certain uh, properties in algebraic geometry, but uh, they are classified uh, by uh, the series of um, N surfaces. Uh, and uh, they are obtained, those BKs are very simple things. They are obtained by blowing up uh, the complex projective plane CP2 at k generic points. Or uh, if you uh, are more familiar with the notation of uh, symplectic geometry or more topological notation, it's um, the connected sum of CP2 with k copies of CP2 bar, the same as manifold as CP2, the complex projective plane, uh, but uh, with uh, orientation reversed. Okay, so it's kind of similar to adding handles uh, or surgery in topology, something that uh, that Sophia was talking about the other day. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's this similar process. Uh, it works like this. Here I stole uh, this picture from uh, Hartshorn's famous algebraic geometry text. Um, so, uh, this is a picture of a blow up. On the right hand side, we have a surface. Oops, I shouldn't have done this. Yeah, on the right hand side, we have a surface, the original surface, say, uh, what did I write there? CP, mm, I don't know, maybe I meant the complex projective plane. So you take, yeah, I think it is CP2 over here. So uh, you blow up this point in the center of this disk, but you know, the surface is just a fragment, a local piece of this. It's, uh, it's a two dimensional complex disk uh, on CP2. Then the CP2 extends somehow around this, but this is the local picture around the point that we blow up. And so what the blow up, what it does, it, it inserts or glues it, instead of this point, you remove this point. So it's like surgery, but an algebraic geometry. You remove this point and insert a projective line, CP1, instead of this point. And you insert it, you glue it in instead of this point, uh, so that uh, whenever the points that approach uh, this point, the point, uh, the points around uh, around this point on the original complex projective plane, which are around this point, uh, which approach this from a particular direction, uh, correspond to the uh, to, to the line, or oh, sorry, to the point on CP1, which which corresponds to that particular line in this piece of CP2 of of C2. So this locally, this disk is like C2, the complex, uh, the complex plane, and uh, CP1, the, the complex projective line, can, is the set of lines in C2 in the complex projective, in the complex plane. And so when you approach along a line here, uh, it tells you which. Uh, so you look at this line uh, over there, and it tells you which point of. CP1 you're approaching to just by the fact that this line corresponds to a point of CP2, of CP1, sorry, of CP1. And uh, and then you do this for all the lines and there is a process uh, described in algebraic geometry on how you uh, nicely glue this and obtain a new surface from that uh, called the blow up. And then you iterate the process. You, uh, or you, can, or you can either iterate the process and bl keep blowing up different points on this uh, blown up surface to obtain B2, and then another we blow up another point, you obtain B3, or you can just take CP2 and blow up several points in general position, in, gen uh, in general position uh, on CP2. This will give you the same result. So this is a certain algebraic geometric process. You obtain a series of surfaces, complex algebraic surfaces, and um, they um, uh, and they're called uh, the surfaces. You can keep blowing up 
but uh, they wouldn't be the Pesa services. They will lose certain properties uh, that um, I, I, I characterize uh, Del Pesa services. You get some other services, more and more complicated services, but they wouldn't be qualified to be called Del Pesa services. So there is, again, um, in the classification of algebraic surfaces, Del Pesa services uh, take a very distinguished place. And this is uh, this series. Okay, so uh, the first uh, maybe relation to uh, to the EK series uh, of exceptional roots uh, may be written down as this E10 uh, in quotes diagram, uh, Dinkin diagram. So uh, if you look at Del Pesos, then there is the series of blow ups, and you can uh, associate oops, to every Del Peso surface, B0, B1, B2, B3, and so on. Um, uh, you can associate a node on the diagram, and and the edge means uh, you put an edge where you do a blow up to obtain the next surface. So to go from B0 to B1, you uh, blow up one point, you get B1. To go from B1 to B2, you blow up one point, you get B2, and so on. This was uh, the previous slide uh, in principle. But this outlier del peso surface CP1 cross CP1 is not the blow up of anything, but if you blow up one point on it, then you get B2. Get this, the same surface as blowing up two points on CP2. It's the same as you get an isomorphic surface uh, if you blow up CP1 cross CP1 at one point. Uh, and uh, so this is another blow up relation here. And then you keep blowing up and it doesn't really matter where you came from, from here, from here. So this looks like an E10 uh, diagram. And in physics, uh, when you look at dimensional reductions of supergravity uh, to various, uh, on various tori, physicists call it wrapping uh, the theory on uh, a torus, uh, also known as toroidal compactifications. Uh, of M theory, you start with M theory, you reduce the dimension or make a toroidal uh, or wrap things uh, over S1, uh, and you get a 10 dimensional uh, type 2A string theory, you get to a 10 dimensional space, then you again wrap around another copy of S1, you get to nine dimensions, and uh, you want to look at supergravity in nine dimensions and so on. Uh, you, you keep wrapping, uh, nobody goes beyond three dimensions for some reason, uh, which is also perhaps mysterious from uh, from the uh, math perspective, but uh, on the other hand, we'll, we uh, sort of explain this mathematically. So, um, and then uh, there is also an outlier theory, the 10 dimensional type 2B string theory, and those uh, two type 2A and type 2B th string theories are related by T duality in physics. Uh, and uh, so these lines actually mean dimensional reduction. So if you do dimensional reduction from 10 from 10 D to B string theory, you get to 9 D theory, which is the same as going from type to A. And, and this is part of this T duality because that in T duality going down here and down there, and well and up there is uh, the same. You obtain the same theories, equivalent theories. Uh, and then again, you keep going. So this this is one pattern which uh, resembles of uh, the EK series, this 10, 10 D schematic diagram. But what's more convincing about the relation of both subjects to the EK series is uh, the next slide. Well, the, actually, I meant to write this slide. So this this is um, the table in which we. Uh, I list different values of k's, and then um, the uh, various del piazza surfaces. Um, then, yeah, so this uh, series of surfaces, this is B0 or CP2, B1, this is the outlier uh, CP1 cross CP1, well, I, I left the C for complex numbers out, B2, B3, B4 through B8, and then the Dinkin diagram, well, they give rise to uh, root systems by uh, when you look at their second uh, integral cohomology groups. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, is, it turns out to be a lattice. There is no torsion there. It's just uh, a lattice, a free abelian group on uh, a few variables, on a few generators. And uh, then it has a natural um, uh, 
um, inner product, uh, which is given by the intersection form, you intersect uh, you know, two dimensional, say, cycles uh, on the, the Delpesa surface, and you get uh, the intersection index, the intersection number, and uh, this gives you uh, this natural form there. Uh, and from this data, you can actually uh, recover. Uh, you can construct by purely algebraic means, so it's kind of a black box. You run some uh, linear algebra uh, or uh, lattice, lattice theory, uh, and you create uh, a root a root system. Uh, and so, depending on where you are, which surface you started up with, you get uh, root systems of this type. And uh, well, you you might be familiar with those three exceptional Dinkin diagrams corresponding to E6, E7, E8. But uh, for low levels, you get um, the following Dinkin diagrams: two empty Dinkin diagrams uh, at the first stages. Then the this is not the zero. This is the Dinkin diagram consisting of one node. Uh, corresponding to CP1 cross CP1 and CP2. Uh, so this uh, the, uh, uh, type A1 uh, root systems. Then uh, what corresponds to B2 is uh, A2 cross A1. Uh, this disconnected Dinkin diagram, basically the, the uh, disjoint union of A2 and A1. The next one is A4, then D5, and so on. You can think of this process as follows. You take the diagram for E8 and the Dinkin diagram for E8, and you start cutting it at various places. So if you cut it, say here, and look what you have left, uh, to, uh, what you have left on the left of the cut, then you get the E8 diagrams, and then you are here. If you cut over here by a slanted line, then what's left uh, on the left of the cut is uh, is this diagram, which is E7. Then the next cut is uh, is well, the next cut is here, so you, what, what you have is E6. And then uh, the cut here gives you a diagram which is known to be D5, if you cut at this place. Now, if you cut at this place, you get uh, this part of, uh, of the diagram, which is the same as A4. And if you cut here, this is why the cuts were slanted, you get uh, to the left uh, of the cut, you get uh, this diagram, which is A2 cross A1, and then keep going, you get A1, and then at the last two stages, you get the empty diagrams. So again, this is kind of a known pattern in the business uh, of those little passive surfaces, uh, how it works, how it arises. It's all handled by algebraic geometry means, but it's very simple. It's basically the lattice theory for the two-dimensional cohomology group uh, of uh, the surface. Okay, and then, yeah, uh, well, uh, those root systems are just uh, collections of vectors. These are examples of um, of uh, the root system B2 over here. This is the root system A1 cross A1. Uh, so A1 is just would be just one of those lines. It consists of two elements, alpha and negative alpha, like here, alpha and negative alpha. And uh, the, the other copy of A1 here is beta and negative beta. Uh, and uh, I didn't sketch A2 cross A1, which arises for the del piezo surface B2, uh, because uh, the picture would be a three-dimensional picture when, when you take A2 cross A1. A1 cross A1 is planar, whereas A2 cross A1 would be three-dimensional. I, I didn't, just didn't know how to sketch it. Uh, so uh, these are those root systems, very simple combinatorial objects related to Symmetries relate to the groups in the algebra. Okay, so um, this is yeah. This was the this uh, wraps up the algebraic story, the algebraic geometric story. So there is a sequence of surfaces like the the upper part of this diagram. There is a sequence of surfaces with one outlier, which and gives rise to uh, those root systems and uh, Dinkin diagrams. Uh, by running a certain standard, uh, a standard yoga of uh, of uh, algebraic geometry, combinatorics, root systems. Then the next slide is uh, the physics part. 
So the physics part is uh, what was going down here, uh, which I sketched in this schematic diagram. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a table taken from the original paper of Iqbal, Naisky and Wafa. Uh, and it tells you that uh, how they, well, gives you some indication how the elements of the EK root system pattern show up in physical theories. So here is uh, just one physical theory, K equals one, which corresponds to del peso surface B1. And in physics, it's the type 2A string theory, which is the same as M theory. Uh, well, from this perspective, at least um, wrapped uh, on one copy of this one. So um, these are the homology classes or cohomology classes. It doesn't really matter because the surface is compact uh, oriented. Uh, so these are two-dimensional homology classes or cycles on the Riemann surface. There, is, there are those standard cycles, which actually I tried to sketch on this blow-up picture. Like if you have uh, a line in CP2, which is actually, oh yeah, this is this was CP1. So the line H is a copy of CP1, which lies in CP2, just on the line sitting in, in uh, the, the complex projective line sitting in the complex projective plane. Uh, and then it, it you can pull it back to the blow up. The blow up my map goes this way, but you can pull this line back, take the pre-image of this, and it gives give, gives you a line H here. Uh, but uh, there was another copy of the projective line here, which is called the exceptional divisor, and this is um, this line CP1 that you that you glue in instead of this point in the process of blow up. So there are sort of two uh, different, very different lines. One comes from a line there, and the other one comes from this point uh, on the original blow, uh, plane, which is blown up. And uh, and this is uh, what I refer to in this table. So uh, this is the exceptional on divisor line, and H is the line that came from CP2, from a line on CP2. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, take homology classes, like linear combinations of those, uh, two-dimensional cycles uh, on this uh, del peso surface B1. And then um, th the physicists uh, associated to them certain brains in type 2A theory. Brains are like little surfaces that flow in, um, well, of, of arbitrary dimension in principle that flow in space-time and uh, over which you want to integrate uh, some certain quantities like physical fields, potentials, you integrate them over over those uh, services and you get tensions, energies, and whatever. And, uh, and they looked at the tensions of those uh, brains, different types of brains, like each brain has a certain uh, very important meaning uh, uh, in string theory. And uh, the brains of different dimensions, and you take take their tensions, and then you notice there are expressions for those tensions. I would actually look up, uh, look at the left hand side of this, uh, of, of those equations. The, you know the different uh, sort of coordinate systems in which, or different notations in which they write those things. But you notice the following thing that the D zero brain is. Uh, given his tension is given by this expression, the f string is given by this expression, so on. But there is some mm, par there are some parallels between the left hand side and the, and the right and those tensions. So, for example, R corresponds to negative i, whereas L p cube or negative cube corresponds to h. So it, it goes the same way. And so uh, uh, Iqbal, Naisky, and Wafa made sort of they noticed this pattern between tensions that in algebraic geometry you look at those homology classes in uh, type to a string theory you look at those brains with those tension you look at their tensions and you notice that there is some there are some parallels so they say they must correspond those brains must correspond to those homology classes on the piston surfaces but why uh, the only explanation was uh, those tensions now so uh, a lot of uh, was left uh, as mysterious after their paper. Paper, namely, it's uh, uh, you conclude that physics and algebraic geometry give rise to the to the same EK series, but there is no there was no explicit connection between physics and surfaces. Okay, 
Now, what uh, we do with Hisham is the following uh, take on mysterious duality, which we call mysterious triality. Uh, so what Iqbal, Naitsky, and Waffa uh, suggested is certain, a certain mysterious duality between algebraic geometry and physics. We add another uh, node to this, another vertex to this tri to, to create a triangle, uh, and this vertex is called algebraic topology. And um, uh, notice the arrows connecting those things. So this is a hypothetical error, arrow uh, of uh, Iqbal, Naitsky, and Waffa that there must be some explicit relation between physics and algebraic geometry, but I sketched it as a dotted arrow, uh, meaning that uh, it's, uh, uh, this correspondence is not, is not really explained in a constructive or conceptual way, uh, only by, uh, by noticing common patterns between the two. Now, here the arrow is solid because uh, we actually give a conceptual explanation uh, of how physics is related to algebraic topology. And this is perhaps why I'm talking on this conference. Uh, it's topological methods in mathematical physics. So it's uh, a, a, a nice illustration of how they can be applied. Uh, and so we, uh, we have mm, this, a similar pattern. Uh, we noticed that the similar pattern, uh, the EK series pattern, arises in algebraic topology. Uh, and uh, we related it constructively directly to those physical theories, to those uh, uh, supergravities in different dimensions, coming from re reducing uh, dimensional reductions of uh, 11 dimensional M, th M theory. And uh, so we, we basically created another duality, which we were able to explain explicitly. Uh, so still, we, we haven't been able to explain explicitly uh, the duality between physics and algebraic geometry, but look what this uh, triangle does. You, you complete it to, with another arrow and you get duality between algebraic geometry and uh, algebraic topology. And so I will conclude afterwards well, in a few, in, in half an hour, roughly, I will I will conclude uh, with a conjecture, a conjectural relation, but with now within mathematics. Uh, so Iqbal, Naitsky, and Waffa is a relation between physics and algebraic geometry. So if you know, uh, uh, a, no, a normal person knows one side of things and doesn't know the other. Uh, well, some of us are uh, less normal and know uh, things better, know both sides of the story. Uh, uh, and so, um, well, for instance, Hisham Sadi, my co-author, is one of those people, one of those remarkable people who know both roads, who are fluent in both roads. And so uh, a conjecture about some relation between physics and algebraic geometry is unapproachable for algebraic geometry, geometers, uh, and uh, uh, just like for physicists. But uh, but this part of the, uh, the conjecture that we make is between algebraic geometry and algebraic topology, and this is an explicit, uh, concrete conjecture about a certain relation between uh, algebraic geometric objects and algebraic topological objects. Okay, uh, but on the other hand, we kind of uh, solve uh, at least part of the mystery of, if you uh, view this duality suggested by Iqbal. Uh, Naitsky and Waffa as duality between physics and mathematics, we kind of solve it because we present a series of mathematical objects which is directly related to, to those toroidal compactifications with very explicit things. And you'll see those equations, uh, equations of motion coming out of topology uh, on the next slides. So the main results uh, uh, are, are kind of twofold. On the math physics side, we uh, we show that the uh, well uh, to be more concrete, not not just algebraic top topology, but uh, the rational homotopy theory of certain iterated loop, uh, cyclic loop spaces. And, and these are this is the notation for those related to the uh, four-dimensional sphere. For k equals zero is just a four-dimensional sphere is explicitly related to, to the M theory story. For example, if you want equations of motion of M theory wrapped on T5 on the five dimensional so torus, i.e., the six dimensional supergravity, you can read them off the differential in the uh, Sullivan model of uh, this uh, five 
followed simplification of S4. I will uh, uh, show you uh, uh, this a, little, a bit more concretely on one of the slides. So mathematically, um, the mathematical side of our results is that we take this sequence of, of topological spaces, S4, then certain loop space associated to S4, then uh, the iteration of this construction, like a double uh, loop space of the cyclic uh, type associated to S4 and so on, you get a new series of objects in mathematics they, which have a hidden internal EK symmetry. And um, for example, we find 27 lines on uh, in uh, this uh, six, uh, uh, six fold simplification of S4. We find 28 by tangents in the seven uh, in the seven uh, fold simplification of S4. Uh, so uh, sort of analogs of those classical algebraic geometric things show up for those algebraic topologic, uh, topological spaces. Uh, you will see some glimpses of this. So what are those cyclic loop spaces? So I'm, and now I will uh, talk a bit about the algebraic topological side of the story. So what are those um, uh, cyclic loop spaces? So the uh, you start with the free loop of a topological space Z. It's the space of maps from S1 to Z. Uh, and uh, the space of maps admits a natural action of the group S1 by rotating the loops. So, you, uh, you, uh, you know, the points of the space are maps from the standard copy of S1 to the space Z uh, and uh, sort of uh, loops. This is called the free loop space. Uh, and uh, then you, uh, if you rotate the loop, uh, well, those loops came come with coordinates, with the natural, say, angular coordinate, and because uh, you take the standard copy of S1 here, it has its angular coordinate. So you uh, then, but you, if you mod out by the action of S1, uh, by rotating loops, you get, um, mod out this space. You get another space, which is called the signification of Z. Well, actually, to be more precise, you take the homotopic quotient, which is, uh, well, this double uh, quotient notation means you take the homotopy quotient. The action of S1 on the, on the free loop space is not free. Uh, it actually has uh, some fixed points, namely the constant loops, for example, are fixed by uh, this action of rotation. Uh, and to avoid this problem, you uh, in, in rational homotopy, you, uh, sorry, in homotopy theory, you take the homotopy quotient of this space, uh, which may be obtained by the parallel construction, which is like this. But uh, um, so you can think of just uh, as an approximation to this process, you can think of just taking the free loop space and modern out, uh, modern out by uh, the group uh, S1 of rotations. Even though these are rigid rotations is basically, you may view this as a, 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 the space of unparameterized loops. You basically lose the parameter. Uh, on the loop. Uh, of course, you don't lose the angular parameter completely if you mod out by S1, but uh, S1, the group S1, the Lie group S1 is uh, a homotopy equivalent to the Lie group div S1. Uh, and, um, well, div plus S1, the, the orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of S1. And so because of this, is uh, modding out by S1 from the point of view of topology, uh, which ignores homotopy equivalences, which are basically thinks of homotopy equivalences as equivalences. Uh, 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 modern out by S1 is the same as modern out by uh, diffeomorphisms of S1. And this means we basically uh, for, forget uh, the parameterization. So a point of the space uh, of the cyclic cyclification is uh, a loop uh, in, uh, in Z, in the space Z, uh, without any parameterization an unparameterized loop uh, in, in the space Z. And then you can iterate this construction of taking the loop, the cyclic, we call it the cyclic loop space of the cyclification, because you mod out by this S1, uh, you cyclify things, and uh, then uh, you take iterations of this process, and this, uh, this way you get multiple cyclifications, or multiple cyclic loop space. And we are mostly interested, as you may, may guess from the physics uh, side of the story, in, in those uh, KFO simplification of the four-dimensional sphere for K between zero and eight. 
So this is what uh, the main objects uh, of the series of topological spaces would, uh, are. And uh, now I want to um, associate to them uh, certain algebraic objects which are known as, uh, which are given by rational homotopy theory, which are known as the Sullivan and Quillian models of those spaces. So in rational homotopy theory, which actually ignores spaces, uh, well, ignores the difference between two spaces if they are not only homotopy equivalent, but if they are rationally homotopy equivalent. So this means uh, a map between two spaces which induces an isomorphism of their rational homology. So uh, rationally homotopy equivalent spaces are basically considered to be equivalent in rational homotopy theory. And then you want, and it turns out that uh, when you place this uh, pretty rough equivalence relation, uh, mm, you uh, uh, may classify uh, those uh, rational homotopy types, that is spaces up to a rational homotopy, you may classify them by certain algebraic gadgets, namely by differential graded commutative algebras. So each space gets associated a differential graded commutative algebra. So an, an object of, it doesn't really matter what it is, it's some algebraic object which you associate to every topological space. And it classifies the rational homotopy type. That is, it classifies the space, it define, determines the space up to rational homotopy equivalence. And um, also you can associate, this, this uh, DGCA is called the Sullivan minimal model. You can also associate the Quillen minimal model, which is a differential graded Lie algebra to a space. And they also classify uh, topological space as well of certain good enough type, uh, again, up to rational homotopy equivalence. And we also, need, uh, will be, we, well, it's a little technical statement that we are using R in place of Q. Of Q. Instead of rational homotopy theory, we are working with rational homotopy theory over the reals. It's not called, call, it's not somehow called the real, it's not called real homotopy theory. It's actually a rational homotopy theory over the reals. So the upshot is, to every topological space, uh, there is this canonical construction of a, a uniquely defined uh, differential graded commutative algebra. We will be most to look, be looking at those, uh, some algebraic object associated to topological space by uh, by running the machine of uh, rational homotopy theory. And exactly this object is what's on the one hand is related to physics, on the other hand is and gives rise for those particular spaces for significations, when you run it over those significations, apply the Sullivan minimal model to those, then um, you get, uh, you, you, we are able to extract the EK series pattern from those significations. So here's, um, I'm just skipping some, some of the slides, but um, uh, the Sullivan minimal model of S4 uh, is, uh, for instance, as an example, is described by those equations. So it's actually the algebra, the graded commutative algebra generated by two elements, one in degree four, another in degree seven. Uh, and uh, so it's freely generated uh, by those elements. Uh, so, uh, so it's like the uh, symmetric or polynomial algebra in G4 and like the exterior algebra in G7 because G7 has an odd degree and G4 has an even degree. So it's basically like the product of the polynomial algebra in one variable, the tensor product of the polynomial algebra in one variable and the exterior algebra based on one generator, the Grassmann algebra based on one generator. And uh, it has, it's a differential graded commutative algebra uh, and it has, uh, uh, the differential part means it has a differential and the differential is defined this way, like DG4 is zero, and G4 is otherwise enclosed, and DG7 is uh, negative one half G4 squared. So and if we apply this differential out of this element of degree seven, you get an element of degree eight, and this must be equal to this. This is how this differential is defined. And this is the notation for the degree of those elements. Then over here, uh, you, um, uh, well, you, how is it related to S4? Uh, it's related to the DRAM cohomology of uh, S4, to, well, to the DRAM, actually, DRAM algebra, to the algebra of differential forms 
uh, on S4, and the differential there is the drum differential. So uh, this generated G4, you, you choose a volume form on, on S4 and map G4 to, to this volume form, you map G7 to zero, and it turns out that this is a quasi uh, isomorphism. You get a map of differential graded algebras. First of all, it's easy to see that this defines a map of differential graded uh, commutative algebras. And it's, uh, it, it's easy to see that this map is a quasi isomorphism, which means it induces an isomorphism on cohomology. Here you take you can take the cohomology of this differential D and see what it is. And here you take the cohomology, the drum cohomology of S4, and uh, you uh, all, uh, all know what this is, uh, or uh, at least took some classes uh, which computed this cohomology. Uh, and then um, from, so from this map, uh, you may obtain actually uh, almost a map from uh, the, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, this was a map from uh, from M, uh, from the Sullivan minimum model, how it's related to the DRAM uh, algebra of S4, but also what you may do is uh, you take the uh, differential forms on the 11 dimensional space time of supergravity uh, of M theory, this is why why is the 11 dimensional space of M theory and you can create a map from this minimal Sullivan model of S4 to this uh, drum uh, algebra of uh, of the 11 dimensional space by uh, mapping G4 to little g4 to capital g4 and little g7 to capital g7 what are those uh, uppercase just g4 and g7 these are uh, certain form fields or uh, fundamental fields of supergravity in 11 dimensions. There is a four dimensional field and there is a seven dimensional field, which are represented by differential forms for a four form and a seven form. And if you map G4, little G4 to this capital G4 and little G7 to this uh, uppercase G7, then you obtain a map between those two differential graded uh, commutative algebras, which actually creates uh, Almost uh, almost creates a map from between topological spaces going backwards. Uh, if something so, the, um, the Sullivan minimum model is related to the drum algebra on S4. So if, if differential forms map this way, then the spaces would map that way. And this way, you get a map from Y11 to S4. Well, uh, not really to S4, but a, but a certain model uh, of uh, like a, a rational uh, model over the reals. But uh, uh, let me let leave this aside and, and uh, think uh, think that we have a map from Y11 to S4. Actually, uh, Hisham and his quarters, uh, uh, including Urs uh, Schreiber, uh, claim uh, well in, explain in one of their papers uh, why there is actually an actual map going from the 11 dimensional space time to S4, which is related to this remark about uh, about. Uh, the Sullivan minimum model uh, and, uh, and those fields uh, G4 and G7. So uh, those G fields G4 and G7 satisfy the equations of motion of 11 dimensional supergravity. And these are the equations of motion. There is this extra equation, which we think of as, which actually involves the metric because this is the Hodge dual. And so we are looking at uh, what, uh, at, uh, what we call duality symmetric formulation, which is metric free background, which means we leave this uh, mm, uh, equation alone and only look at those equations. And we think of this extra data as uh, being less fundamental is some extra data, metric data, which is imposed on, uh, on this data. So of course it's very important data, uh, but more fundamental is, what's more fundamental is topology as opposed to uh, differential geometry. So differential geometry is based usually on some topological spaces on manifolds and uh, you get you add some extra data, which is the metric, say the Riemannian metric data. And uh, and this is what uh, what we are talking about. So the topology is sitting in those two equations, the geometry is sitting in those equations, both are both roads are important, but uh, this is the road which corresponds to the topology. And so uh, these are the uh, so these are the equations of motion of eleven dimensional supergravity uh, or supergravity corresponding to M theory, uh, and uh, and these are the same equations of uh, 
uh, that that you get rid of in this algebraic model related to S4 to this uh, in the Sullivan minimal model, and uh, they uh, and this remark about the this uh, the fact that those uh, equations look exactly the same uh, is uh, belongs to Hisham Sadia, and he called it the uh, he called, he calls it hypothesis eight H. He came up with it in 2013 and then uh, wrote several papers himself and with his co-authors uh, justifying this hypothesis that uh, oops, something happened. How can I get rid of this maybe like that? All right. Yeah, I, I think I have to live with this because I I don't see this little. Like this? No. How do I get rid of this thing on the right? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this uh, age hypothesis notices that those two uh, roads are directly related, the road of supergravity with those uh, fields, G4 and G7, and those equations of motion, and uh, the road of topology of the four-dimensional sphere, uh, which uh, going through uh, rational homotopy theory. Now, uh, Type to a string theory. Yeah, so uh, if you continue this pattern, like if you reduce the dimensions, you, if you take the steroidal compactification and wrap M theory on S1, you get a 10 dimensional space time. And, and this is naturally related to the uh, uh, signification of S4, to this cyclic loop space of S4. And uh, uh, again, you uh, compute the Sullivan minimal model of this new space. So basically, you know, if you have a map from y from the eleven-dimensional space to S four, and then if you could take the quotient of S one by S one, uh, every point here in in this quotient is an orbit of S one, and uh, those orbits are mapped to S four. And when you map this orbit of S one, you get a loop in S four. And this orbit doesn't know where the beginning point of this uh, loop is. And so this is why you get a point in this uh, cyclic loop space, uh, phi 1, as induced by phi. And so then if you run the minimal Sullivan model on this space, uh, you find out that it's a certain algebra with certain generators and certain formulas for the differential. But the thing is that uh, those formulas are exactly replicas of the equations of motion of type uh, 2a supergravity in 10 dimensions. Uh, if you just relabel those uh, things, that, uh, those not, uh, generators of the Sullivan minimal model uh, in, the, in this notation, if you just relabel them, you would get uh, the equations which are more familiar to people who do uh, supergravity. So this is the, the, these are the equations of motion of, two of 10 dimensional supergravity. Uh, okay, and this this came out of uh, a paper of well, actually several papers. But the first paper was, I think, in two thousand seven by Fiorenza, Sate, and Schreiber. Okay, the the fact that they note that uh, the ten dimensional type two A theory is related to uh, well has those equations coming from rational homotopy theory those equations for the differential are exactly the same as the defining equations uh, of motion of uh, two, type 2a supergravity. And this pattern continues for all k, so you get this uh, sequence of uh, double, uh, of spaces, of space times. You start with the 11-dimensional space time of M theory, you um, mod it out by S1, you get uh, which acts, uh, which you assume acts on the 11 dimensional space, you get the type 2a string theory in 10 dimensions, then you mod out by another copy of S1, you get a 9d supergravity space time, and so on. And each time around, you uh, get just from this map phi, 
by this process that I described on the previous slide, you get uh, maps uh, first phi one to from this ten dimensional space to the uh, single signification of S4, then from the nine dimensional space to the double signification of S4, and so on. So this pattern continues. Uh, and, and this is what's the amazing part, uh, sort of the upshot of the math physics part. Now, there is a recipe which was worked out by Vigier Poirier and Borghella in 1985 on how to obtain, uh, if you know, uh, uh, a space, the cell of the minimum model of a space, how to obtain the cell of the minimum model of signification. So here, if we apply it to the series of k fold signification of sport, it tells us it's just an algebraic recipe on how to create the next model. Okay, and um, for example, for example, if you start with the model, the cell of the minimum model f s four, which is described as simple as this, just the algebra on two generators and the differential is described like this. I'm skipping the part d g four equals zero. Uh, and usually, it's assumed. Then uh, applying this machine of uh, Vigier, Poirier, and Bourguelle. You get that uh, this uh, solvent minimum model of the signification of S4 is given by those generators and equations. You, so out of G4, G7, you create two extra generators called SG4, SG7 of degree one less than those, the degrees of those, and then a two dimensional generator W, and everything satisfies those equations. And so uh, here's uh, the point uh, of, of the physical story. If you want equations of motion uh, of five dimensional supergravity, for instance, or whatever dimensional supergravity, you just uh, run the signification recipe over this, uh, of, and given by the previous theorem of the Gepoirier and Borgelia, 11 minus five, which is six times, and get very many, very complicated equations, which exactly match the equations of five dimensional supergravity, yeah. uh, which physicists obtain the hard way. This was the hard work of writing uh, out the desires of Lagrangian with desired invariance properties. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going well, maybe I'll run through the slides. slides. Yeah, so with desired invariance properties and then running, uh, writing out the Euler Lagrange equations uh, for the Lagrangian. Uh, and uh, and this way you obtain a bunch of equations uh, that is that in physics, but uh, here it's it's just uh, a sort of a canonical recipe. You start with this very simple uh, type uh, equation, while the other one is dg four equals zero. You get those equations. This is these are equations of the two of the ten dimensional supergravity of type two a. And then you run it again, you get equations of nine dimensional supergravity and so on. And this way you can obtain very complicated equations, but by a very straightforward algebraic process. But the math part of the story, and let me finish with those with theorems. Uh, the math part of the story is that uh, you, what's interesting is that those spaces uh, the series of, of significations of S4 are, which are directed by the previous related to the physical models, to the toroidal compactifications of M theory. Those spaces uh, give rise to, uh, to, um, oh, this is this next theorem, give rise to the EK uh, series of root systems, just like the del Piazza surfaces do. Uh, so uh, the first theorem is that if you look at uh, the uh, Automorphism group uh, of the Sullivan minimal model, uh, then it turns out that it, that it its maximal R split torus, whatever that means, but uh, certain real split torus uh, maximal, uh, the largest split torus which sits in this automorphism group of the Sullivan minimal model, it turns out to be k plus one dimensional, a torus like you take non zero real numbers to the power k plus one, this is a group. And uh, and this is uh, the maximal torus. We identify this maximal torus. It's exactly it exactly has this dimension. And then in its Lie algebra, uh, the Lie algebra of this torus of this maximal R split torus of uh, of the automorphism group of the Sullivan minimal model of, of the K-fold signification of S four, we find a natural basis which gives the lattice uh, an integral inner product and a distinguished element. Uh, like this, 
so that uh, you get a lattice with an inner product and a distinguished element, and this works the same way as for Del Piazza surfaces. Uh, from, again, from some algebra, you uh, get uh, the uh, root system EK uh, zero. Yeah, and this algebra. So this this is the story. Uh, I probably need half a minute to finish. Uh, yeah, so this al algebraic structure produces the root system. <laughs> okay. So this algebraic structure produces the root system just by uh, standard means. It's like known that if you have a free abelian uh, group uh, with an in a symmetric bilinear form, an inner product, and a distinguished element uh, of this type in it, you would get uh, uh, the root system EK corresponding to it. So it comes with a vial group, which is related to U-duality. Uh, but now it's in the context of simplifications rather than uh, del Piazza surfaces. Skip this. And this is the conjecture that I promised uh, between algebraic geometry and algebraic topology. So there must be an explicit relation. And the conjecture is, of course, uh, um, motivated by uh, by the physics pattern, by this, uh, by uh, com combining uh, the previous statement about the relation of the simplifications of S4 to physics, to the toroidal compactifications of, this, of the 11 dimensional space time. Uh, 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 and the paper of Iqbal, Naiski, and Waffa that, that those things in physics are related to algebraic geometry. So we get this conjecture about the relation between algebraic geometry and algebraic topology, that there should be an explicit relation between the series of the Piazza surfaces and the series of those iterated loop spaces of S4. And this relation should match the EK symmetry patterns that occur in, in both roads and uh, all uh, lots of geometric data. And I want to conclude with that. So if somebody uh, knows how to solve this conjecture, please let me know.